I was really looking forward to coming and talking to you guys today because I always wish that that when I was in junior high or high school that somebody would come talk to us about books. Um, I'm from Riverside. And you can make fun of it all you want. Um, <laughs> totally okay with that. I lived three blocks from where I was born in Riverside. So I went to elementary school, junior high. I went to North High in Riverside. And then I got a full scholarship to come here to USC. It was a big deal. It was really, really scary. Um, that's what I, I usually tell the truth. It was really scary to come from Riverside from a really poor family um, and to show up at USC. It was even weirder to be blonde because then people assumed I had money. <laughs> so sad. Um, <laughs> my middle life, three daughters. The oldest one is a senior in college in Ohio where it is very, very cold and snowy. The middle kid visited the older daughter in Ohio and was like, yeah, that's not going to work for me. So she's a sophomore here. She's here with us today and visiting. She's Woo! in the back. She's wearing the orange. Yay! That's my middle kid. which I'm going to talk about in This is her when she was a lot younger. My youngest kid is a sophomore in high school, and right now she's got a sports event that I am not present at, and so she is texting me that she is pissed that I'm hanging out with other people's high school and junior high students and not her own. <laughs> so she's saying, I was looking forward to coming and talking to you because I had a, a few specific things to say, which is no one in my neighborhood was expected to go to college. No one in my neighborhood was expected to be a writer, that's for sure. The big deal in my neighborhood was sports. And I know you guys might like sports. I love sports, too. I put a lot of sports um, in some of my writing. But look at me. Do I really look like an athlete? <laughs> I was going to be an athlete until, and this is how I really became a writer. This is the story I really was looking forward to sharing with you. My mom ran me over with the station wagon. Accidentally, she says. Could be. She ran over my legs. If she wanted to kill me, you'd think she would have run over my head. That would have been much yeah, more efficient. So she ran over my legs when I was in the eighth grade, and I ended up in the hospital for two months in traction. And back then it was pretty primitive. They had hung a weight on the back of your on the end of your leg. So since I was stuck in a bed, literally, for two months, I started watching a lot of football. And it was good times. I watched a lot of USC football. I watched a lot of UCLA football. I watched a lot of everything. And I decided I was going to become a sports writer. All right, now, I was a sports writer when I was here at USC, but I had this great professor who said, it really seems like you want to write fiction. And I started writing fiction in little notebooks like these. That's why I brought these for you. It didn't take a computer. It didn't take a laptop. I always write the beginnings of my books in these, these little tiny notebooks, all right? I usually fill up legal pads. Now, how many of you guys write by hand at all? I mean, I know a lot of people compose on the laptop, but. Look, a lot of you write by hand. That's, that's kind of a big thrill for me because everyone's like, oh, no, 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 you got to have an iPad. I don't have an iPad. In fact, if you saw my phone, you would laugh because I can leave it outside on the sidewalk in front of my house for two or three days and no one takes it. <laughs> <laughs> no one takes it. In fact, yesterday I left it in my car with the window open the whole day while I was at work and I didn't have it and I was like, my phone. And I was like, oh, that's right. No one wants it. <laughs> so sitting on the seat, window open. No one would take that phone. You don't have to have an iPad. You don't have to have a laptop. You are going to have to send something electronically eventually, but all you have to have is a pencil and a piece of paper. I mean it. I really do. This is my seventh book, as Jervy said. Um, actually, my seventh book is, you, you'll, you can see it if you look it up there. I brought you a different book. But I wrote all of those books by hand in notebooks. Now, I fill up the legal pads. It took me seven legal pads for this book and seven legal pads for this last book. But I always start with some really particular idea, you know what I mean? And it ends up in one of these. So that's what I wanted to start out by saying. Even though I've been a writer for 20 years, I've been publishing books for 20 years, which makes me really lucky. And I teach writing at UCR. And almost all my students are first generation. What do I mean by that? First generation. first generation to go to college. I was first generation to go to college. My dad didn't even graduate from high school, all right? And <coughs> Delphine and my dad, we met in the eighth grade. He's a very tall man. He looks a little bit like Shaq, and he has hair. He's six four, and he weighs 300 pounds, and that's just a large man, but he does have hair where Shaq is bald. All right, so if you picture us together, and then he went off to another school to play basketball, and I came here, and I ended up being a writer. So what I, what I was going to show you guys today is several books. This was my first book. I wrote this book when I was in graduate school because sports writing got kind of limiting. You know, sports writing I loved, but you win, you lose, or 
you tie, that's pretty much it. So you write the winning story, the losing story, or the weird story where you tie. And that's always <laughs> All right, I started writing fiction about my neighborhood in Riverside. And I began with a couple of really strange short stories. And this is a little scary. I had a really good friend in high school, and I left to come here to USC. I was 17, because I have a late birthday. He was a year younger than me. <laughs> he killed himself. That, that first fall, when I was here in the dorms, he stood in front of a train. That's how he killed himself. And he killed himself because he was using drugs, and he had gotten some drugs from a really, a really horrible person, and that person said, when I see this guy, I'm gonna kill him. And my friend was so mixed up, he was so messed up on these drugs, he thought, I'll just do it myself. And he walked in front of the train and just stood there. So it took me seven years to write a story about that. I mean, when they called me here, when I was in the dorms, and I went back home, there's no way I could process that. <coughs> to stand in front of a train, somebody that I'd known all my life, somebody I had just seen. So it took me seven years to write that story, and these were the stories I started writing in Akhavogi. So to write that story, I thought what would be helpful for you is, let's say something horrible like that happens, right? It's hard to write it, truthfully, isn't it? And, and it's, it was too painful. But to write it as a fiction writer means I think about it for a long, long time, and it comes out in a different way. And the truth is, I write fiction to make myself feel better. Because so many bad things happen all the time. You guys are like, wait, what happened to the good part of your story where we were laughing? <laughs> Lots of bad things happen. And my way of dealing with it has always been, I'm gonna write a story about it. And maybe I can change the ending, or maybe I can make it different. So I thought you might find it interesting that that particular story was not about me and my friend killing himself. I ended up writing from the point of view of a 10-year-old boy who gets put in an educational handicap class because I remember in elementary school I got put in an educational handicap class for math. It's very sad. <laughs> I really can't do math, not at all. The kids stopped asking me for help with math in the sixth grade, let's just say that, okay? I offered them water and company and some cookies, but as far as like doing the problems, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I, I remember being in that classroom and the train would go right by and that's the same train that my friend stood in front of. So I wrote about a kid named Damone who's 10 years old, and his brother is the one who did that. And he's fine until he gets put in an educational handicap class, and then he hears the train going by. So I thought you'd read, I'd read you a little tiny piece of that story. Um, what happens when he hears the train is that he just stops talking. And, uh, <coughs> and his teacher gets really mad at him. And so she assumes he is? Yeah, she assumes he's, he's just dumb, and he's not dumb. He just, once he hears the train, he can't talk. This part's scary. My brother Max smoked a super cool before he did it. He showed me the cigarette. It gotta be a cool, he said. The dude selling it dips a cigarette in the stuff they put on dead people. Bombing fluid, Max told me. I remember I seen a guy smoke one at the playground, and when he started shooting hoop, he died. So I said to Max he shouldn't do that. But he said that was all he had. I'm gonna be gone soon anyway, he said. And then he started walking to the train tracks. And when I went after him, he threw rocks at me. He could pitch real good when we used to play baseball. And he was tagging me in the legs, so I wouldn't try and see. Damone, aren't you able to do those problems? Miss Jackson hauling my face, and I didn't, I didn't even hear her. This book is plus and take away, it's easy for babies. But I only did five, because the train's gonna come. I can hear it far away. I can hear it before it gets here. The train is gonna come, and it's gonna go right by here. And then, I'm gonna think about Max. All right. I have no idea why the fiction writer's brain works that way. Do you know what I mean? Like, some people write a song, and some people paint, and some people write. Some people play sports, some people cook. And for me, when something really scary like that happens, it's best for me to write a story about it. So it took me seven years to write that story, and it's not very long. And if you're thinking, wow, that seems inefficient and dumb, it was because I had to think about who was gonna tell the story. So the most important thing, if you're gonna be a writer, is who's gonna tell the story, right? Is it gonna be first person? What's first person? If it's I, right? So sometimes the story's gonna come out right if it's the first person, it's gonna be I. What if it's third person? Then how is it gonna be? He or she. Right, so it's gonna be Max smoked a super cool before he did it. Damone walked with him to the tracks. This story didn't feel right in third person. It only felt right in first person, and it took me a long time to write it. After I published this book, which um, that was a long time ago, 
it was 1990, and this book came out from a really small press. And um, after I published this book, then it took me a while to write my next book. My next book had football in it. Um, I know you could look up my name and you can look up the other books, but the book I wanted to tell you about next is this one. This book is called High Wire Moon. This is the one I brought you. This one, I started when I was 19 years old. I was home for the summer from USC, and I had three jobs. I worked in a gas station during the afternoon, which was always getting robbed, and my boss, Florencio, took it personally when people would steal gas from him, so his favorite thing to do was jump onto their hoods, beat in their windshield, and take their wallets. It was a very entertaining job at the mobile station where I did not want to work. Florencio looked kind of like a, a mildly more tanned Richard Gere. Um, with the baseball bat. Uh, in the evening, I was a sports writer at the Riverside newspaper. So I would cover, I got to cover the Dodgers. I got to meet Vin Scully, which my mom, I think, really wanted to marry Vin Scully. So that really was points for me. Um, and I also, during the daytime, um, tutored some little kids. So I had three jobs. But one time I was home, and I read the paper, and I saw a story about 19 women who'd been deported. And this was a long time ago. You guys are like, you were 19, you're so old, that must, when was that? Okay. <laughs> really guys, it was 1980, all right? In 1980, this group of 19 women was working at a linen plant, really near my house, because I grew up right near the orange groves in Riverside. And in the orange groves, there was this one linen plant. These women went to work, got picked up by La Migra, and got taken away. I thought, wait a minute, 19 women, that's a lot of kids that got left behind, right? And suddenly I started thinking of my next book, because I'd grown up with foster kids. And when we would get foster kids in the middle of the night, I always wondered, did their moms and dads know they got taken to foster care? You know, if you're in a car accident, the cops come to the house and tell you, you know, your mom's been in a car accident. If your mom or dad goes to prison, if your mom and dad is arrested, if, but what about if you're deported? Does anyone come to the house and tell the kids? No. So I started this novel about a three-year-old girl whose mom is from Oaxaca, and her dad is an American citizen, but he's a drug addict. And she ends up in the backseat of a car, and her mom drives it to a church because her mom's really upset and wants to pray about maybe going back to Oaxaca. And she leaves her daughter in the backseat of the car. And while she goes to the church, she goes around the corner, she sees a statue, she decides she's going to say a prayer. Someone calls the cops, and they call Lamigra, and Lamigra takes her away, and her daughter's left in the backseat of the car. So her daughter wakes up. Her daughter wakes up in the morning, and her mom's gone, and she's in the backseat of the car. Now, if you're three years old and your mom disappears, what do you, whose fault do you think it is if you're three? Don't you always think it's your fault when your parents get divorced? If your parents, she said what? You assume it's whose fault? God's? <laughs> That's actually an answer I've never heard before. <laughs> God took my mom away. God <laughs> All right. For most kids, though, when you when you know when your parents get divorced or if your mom or dad leaves, you assume it's your fault, right? You're like, I should have been a better kid. Yeah. So that's what this little girl thinks. She gets, ends up in foster care, and from the time she's three until she's 14, when I started the book, she always thinks her mother abandoned her. So this book took me forever to write. I started it when I was 19. I wrote the first 50 pages about her waking up in the car and about the woman being taken back to Oaxaca. And then I didn't finish it until I was 34. Mm -hmm. I had to have two kids. I had to go to Oaxaca. I had to figure out how isolated this woman would have been. So I got a grant to go to Oaxaca for three, three weeks. And I already had my three kids at that time. And I tried to think, what would I do if I was separated from these kids? Would I actually walk hundreds of miles and try to cross a border to get back to my daughters? Most definitely. If I were separated from my kids and someone said, you can have your right arm or your left arm, but we're going to take one of them, I wouldn't have any problem with it. I'm right-handed. I make my living with this arm. You could have this arm. <laughs> as long as I still have one, I would be fine. But I needed to have my kids to know that. So I'm not saying you have to have the experience that you're writing about, but for this book, I had to do it. The other books, I didn't have to know it, but by the time I was working on this one, I... I had to know it. So this book is Althea, the, three, uh, the, the girl who's half Mexican and half um, American, and her mom's name is Serafina. And the book is about how the two of them go on this journey to try to find each other again. Um, so this is the one I'm going to give to you guys, okay? Yay. Yeah, I think it's like it's, it's thanks to Derby and the Young People's Literature for Life. I was able to get it for really, really cheap, so that's why we were able to do this. Um, this book has cussing in it, and 
Elvia starts out as a pregnant 14 year old. That's why she wants to go find her mom. So just a thing, there's cussing. Tell your parents I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> After I finish this one, and I'm gonna talk really fast about these next two because I have no idea how much time I have. You're good. I'm You're good? Good. good? Okay. So this <coughs> book, after I finish this book, I mean, it took me a while to recover. It really did. This book was really scary to write because some bad things happen to Serafina when she's trying to cross the border again. She runs into some really bad coyotes. All right? It's really, really scary. That part was hard to write. So I started thinking about what I would do next. And not to embarrass the kid who's here, but she's very beautiful. And I had these three daughters, and they were really beautiful, but they were really smart, too. And this notion was in my head about the way people look at beauty and intelligence and what people expect from girls. And I started thinking about also what it's like to be mixed race in America. And I decided I was going to write a book about someone who was of mixed race. But I didn't want to write a, a truthful novel. Or, I mean, a, you know, a novel set in contemporary times. First, I wrote this book. And now, I wanted to show you these two things. Because when you publish a book, the hardcover usually has one cover. And then sometimes they pick a different one for the paperback. So I thought you might be interested to see these two. Um, actually, you know what's funny about Highwire Moon? This had a different cover in hardcover. When they sent me the first one, this girl was so pale. They're in New York, you know? They're just like, I don't even know if the designer for the paperback read the book. So I remember having to call them and go, this is a white girl. And they're like, yes, you're right. Like, what an idiot. And I'm like, um, the girl in the book is not white. Oh. <laughs> so they're like, so we should darken her? And I was like, that's really weird. Um, she's half Oaxacan, and she's half blonde, crazy American guy. So do what you want. So they kept sending it to me. She was mildly, you know, orange. And I was just like, OK, I guess she's kind of apricot colored now. <laughs> this is Delphine when she was younger. This is. Uh, her sitting at a really small wooden table that we have from my her, Delphine's dad's grandmother who brought it from Mississippi when she moved to California. And I wanted Delphine's curl to be long and to be hanging there because this book was about someone who had that kind of really, really long hair. This is what they did for the paperback cover. And um, they didn't ask me, but I liked this one. I think this one's pretty. This is not Delphine. We were always joking about that. <laughs> this book is about a girl who grows up in slavery in Louisiana. This is my first book I wrote that wasn't set in California. She is 14 years old as well when this book starts. So in this book, it's a plantation, and it's way south of New Orleans. It's where Hurricane Katrina hit. I went to New Orleans. I went to Louisiana. But this book is, was based on a story that actually happened here. When I was a freshman here, I rode the bus to downtown every day to work. And I was the only white person on the bus because the bus that came came from South Central and it went downtown. And everyone else on the bus were black women and we all were going to work. I was working in an office. And there was a woman that used to ride the bus with me. And she was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone as beautiful since. I have not. She was just, her skin was like gold and she had these perfect eyebrows and she had hair that she always kept back in a bun. And she was so shy. And I think it's because all these men were constantly following her around. And whoa, just let me get your number, baby. Please, please, <laughs> please. Like, and it was really weird. And I watched her, and she looked very uncomfortable about that. So I had in my mind that I would write a story about a girl who was very beautiful and how hard it was to grow up in a time, especially during slavery, as a beautiful woman. So that's what this book is about. This, this book, the mother is from Senegal. She came over on the ship with her own mother when she was five years old. So she came over in the middle passage on a slave ship, and her mother hid her in the corner with her arm around her while other people got tossed off the boat, dead. And when they got to Louisiana, her mother still protected her. She was five when she got to Louisiana. She had to learn to speak French because she spoke a different language coming from Africa. Her mother dies after working for many years in the fields. And that young woman, who's from Senegal, is given to a white, French sugar broker as a gift. She's a present for a week while he's visiting. Here, you can have this nice young woman. She's 16. And after he leaves, she has a baby. And that's what the book is about, her raising her daughter. So when I was writing this book, I was still imagining the same thing about a mother and a daughter. Like, what, what would it do if this daughter got sold away from the mother? So that's what this book is about, OK? And then there's one more book that I didn't bring because it's a hardcover. And it's the story of, in fact, if we ever do this again, I'll bring that one for you guys. But it's not in paperback yet. 
But I'll bring that one for you guys. Um, and that book is about The Descendant, the new one. So if you want to look that one up on my website, it's pretty easy. You could also see pictures of my three girls and my nephew, my crazy, crazy nephew, looks like Bob Marley just dropped back onto this planet. <laughs> <laughs> if Bob Marley was a skateboarder, he was kind of crazy. Anyway, so if you look up my name, you can look at all these family pictures, and you can actually see some people in our family that came um, that were came from slavery and came to L.A. And my mom is from Switzerland. You can see pictures of that. And you can see pictures of the way sort of an American family gets laid out. Not the typical, necessarily, oh, everyone thinks the American family looks a certain way, right? I tried to make it so people could see lots and lots of different faces in the American family. The last book I want to show you real quick, this is my children's book. This one is about a little girl who lives in an apartment building, and she really, really wants a dog. And this is too young for you. This is age <laughs> 7 to 10. But you know why I wanted to show it to you? Because if you think about it, how many people have read that book, The Velveteen Rabbit? Right? Where you believe the animal becomes real. That was a big deal as a book for me because my mom would never let me get a dog. She's Swiss, and dogs are messy. And I would just find a dog so that every time my mom would go to work, I would find a stray dog and bring it home. <laughs> and then she'd come back and be like, um, no. And I would cry, please, just let me have a dog. And I never got to have a dog until I got my own house. So I always read The Velveteen Rabbit over and over because I thought, you know, you can make the dog come to life. Well, this book I thought you would find interesting because it's about a little girl who lives in an apartment complex. So she's not allowed to have a dog. And her father leaves. <coughs> And so she has the dog that her father bought her, and she really believes it's real. And she's in the fourth grade, and she takes the dog to show and tell, and she runs into those mean girls on the playground. You know the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> the ones who live in really big houses and have golden retrievers with, like, capers. So sadly enough, I named them Paige and Piper, and I hated them. So I hope you're not named Paige or Piper. Sorry about that. But there were some mean Pages and Pipers that were mean to one of my kids. So I put them in here. <laughs> Someone was mean to Delphine once too, the one back there. So I actually killed that person in the book. What you can do in writing. That's in the new book. This person dies, burns to death in a ditch. You really should not be mean to my children. <laughs> what I'm saying is not that you should kill someone in your novels. <laughs> I'm saying that for me, what I've tried to tell you is that to write fiction is kind of a something that you pull out from deep within you, and it might be something you were scared about, it might be something you wanted to make fun of, and yeah, it could be a revenge thing if you're one of those mystery writers. But mostly, you have to figure out who's telling the story, right? Is it the I voice? Is it the Damone voice? For this book, the woman's name is Moinette. For the other one, it's Elvia and Serafina, but it's third person. So it's all those things that you have to decide when you're going to write your story. You have to say, who's telling the story? How is this person going to describe the eucalyptus tree? Is this person going to describe the eucalyptus tree and the bark is coming off? And you know how the bark looks underneath? It looks like skin. Yeah. Are they going to describe it like maybe a thigh bone stuck in the ground? That's, that's a weird way of looking at it. Or are they going to describe the way the skin comes off? in little ribbon curls, almost like it came off of someone's hair. Those are the things you want to do as a writer, is that my favorite part of writing is describing the way something looks so you actually feel as if you're there. So I wanted to stop there because I wanted to make sure there was time if you guys had any questions, because my favorite part is usually question and answer. Okay? You can't ask me anything about why I'm wearing this jewelry or anything like how I look, because I already heard that before I left from the, the youngest kid. I heard, you're going to wear that. <laughs> oh, she's 15. There's nothing you can say that's going to be mean because I have the meanest child in the world that beat my house. But you can ask me anything else. So questions? Yes? The first book is called Aqua Boogie. This actually comes from a song, Psycho Alpha Beta Disco Bio Aqua Tulu, which Lisa and Aaron are back there like, oh my gosh, you did not say that. Yes, I did. It's a George Clinton Parliament Funkadelic song. I had to pay George Clinton $234 to use the lyrics in the beginning. And I did pay him, and then I heard later that he used that money in not a good way by buying substances which people should not buy. <laughs> but I paid him, and this is, this is what I paid him for. There was a great lyric, and I was lucky enough to study with James Baldwin, one of the, you know, to me, one of the most classic American writers ever. 
And when I got to study with James Baldwin, I had this little thing. I was a graduate student, but I was already married. I lived in a tiny little horrible studio apartment, and he came to our house for dinner. And I had this little thing right here written on a piece of paper and taped to my window. And he came over and saw it, and it says, with the rhythm it takes to dance to, what we have to live through, you can dance underwater and not get wet. And I thought, oh, God, he's going to know I'm from Riverside, and I'm from California, and I listen to Parliament Funkadelic, and he's James Baldwin. He said, that's one of the most profound things I've ever heard. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an idiot, even though I'm from California, and everyone, I, this was in Massachusetts, everyone made fun of me. Oh, you're, you're from California, and you're blonde. Are you going to write about surfing? And I was just like, I'm from Riverside. We don't have water. <laughs> 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 but you're not gonna go surfing on it. And they're like, so wait, is it close to Hollywood? And I was like, not really. And they said, what do you have on the other side? Do you have anything? And I was like, we have tumbleweeds, we have oranges, we have cows, we have methamphetamine, we have everything we need. And then after that, they just didn't say anything. Other questions? Now you guys are scared? Come on. While you were writing those books, did you become like emotionally attached to the characters? Oh, that's a really good question. She said, when I was writing the books, did I become emotionally attached to the characters? Every single time. And you know those characters never do what you want them. They're just like your kids. They never do what you want them to. You're like, wait, why are you pulling out a gun? Don't do that. That's a stupid thing to do. And then I was just like, man, I didn't even know she had a gun. <laughs> this was an older woman in one of my first books, The Getting Place. And something terrible is going to happen. And someone's going to get killed. And all of a sudden, the aunt pulls out a gun from her apron pocket. And I was just like, who knew Auntie Lila had a gun? That's a terrible thing. And then I had to go back and change everything that had come before. But Auntie Lila had a gun because she'd been attacked before, and she kept it in her apron pocket. That's who she was. I always become emotionally attached to the characters, but I think it's become worse as I've gotten older. Because my kids, now the two kids that are in college, and I worry about them in a different way. And I was happy when everyone was in the house, and at night I could go make sure everybody was breathing, and everybody was alive, and then I would go in my little office, and then I would work. And now it's different because I have other things to worry about. So I do become more emotionally attached. And I worried a lot about Serafina and Elvia when I finished this book. I dreamed about them for like two or three months afterwards, about being scared about when Serafina was crossing the border. And Elvia, Elvia went to Mecca to pick grapes, and that was scary. So that's a good question. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's an okay thing if your brain works out. Other questions? No? <laughs> Come on. There has to be one more. She's got one, but she doesn't want to ask it. <laughs> she's going to go like this for a while. No. She's going to put her, no. All right, no more questions at all? <coughs> uh, what was your favorite, what was, uh, I guess, personally your favorite book that you wrote? The favorite book? People always ask me that and I can't say. It's like saying which kid is your favorite. <laughs> 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 My mom definitely had a favorite among all of us kids and that, that was her favorite person and that was my brother who died. In fact, the character, the crazy guy that's in this book, the crazy American guy who's the blonde guy who's got a lot of problems, his name is Larry in this book. He's a lot like my brother, only my brother was a lot scarier than Larry. And my brother died in 2002. I think he was my mom's favorite, and I always felt like it was weird that we knew that. But I don't, even though Delphine seems like, it's me, I'm your favorite. The children always accuse me of loving someone else better, but there's no actual proof that I do. <laughs> I'm very careful to make everything exactly even. And with the books, I think I feel differently about each one. Like, you feel a certain way when you're working on one book, you feel a certain way on the next one. So I've never been able to answer, like, which one is my favorite. Not because I'm being diplomatic, because I'm not alive, so it's not like they care. But I just really, I can't. I can't say that. All right, last thing. How many people in here listen to Art LeBeau? Anybody in here listen to Art LeBeau? <laughs> or your parents do, right? Yeah. And your parents listen to Art LeBeau, and you're like, oh my god, Art LeBeau, please turn it off. All right, Art LeBeau, killer oldies, all that stuff. Oh, yeah, OK, so I wrote, I was just going to tell you this, because if you don't like to write fiction, or you're kind of scared with the whole emotional investment, you can start writing nonfiction. And I wrote an essay about Art LeBeau, because I thought, oh, people back east need to know about Art LeBeau. Art LeBeau is like, you know, part of California. 
So I wrote this essay about Art LeBeau and it's in a magazine called Boom. Art LeBeau called me last Sunday and I was on his show. It was really something. We're going to go have lunch. How weird is that? All right, Art LeBeau <laughs> is one of those kind of things where you have something in your neighborhood that nobody else knows about, right? I mean, you guys are like, no, we know about Art LeBeau. I know. But when I'm running for art for some, somebody in New York and I'm running about something particularly Californian, I like the idea that they need to learn a little bit about us. You definitely have something in your neighborhood or in your house or in your family that nobody else can write about, don't you? There is some kind of story that you heard from your grandma or your neighbor or something, and only you can write about that. So that's what I wanted to leave you with. That's really the best part about being a writer, is that when people write to me and say, oh my god, you, know, you wrote this story, and this is the only time I've ever read about a woman from Oaxaca. I've had people from Oaxaca come up and tell me, I love this book. This is the only time anyone's ever written about me. That's what you need to think about, is that there's definitely something that you can write about that nobody else can write about. It's only your story. And whether you decide to tell it nonfiction, like an essay, or whether you make it into a short story, that's really the best thing you can do, is to sort of bring your voice to other people. Okay? All right, I'm glad you came. Thank you.